Hear God's call to his rescued people. You yourselves, said the Lord, have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests a holy nation. We gather, friends, in the name of this God who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light that we might proclaim the beauties of his grace. And so we're going to begin our worship this morning by doing just that. Let's stand and sing the hymn on the screens. Come, people of the risen King who delight to bring him praise.
Well, let's bow our heads and pray together. Father God, it is indeed our delight, our duty and our joy to bring you praise as the one who alone we call our King, our Maker, our Redeemer, and our Friend. We thank you, Lord, that like your people of old, you have borne us to yourself on eagle's wings, that the gulf of sin that we could never cross, you closed for all time in your Son. We thank you, Father, that at his cross, everything ugly, everything wrong, everything that would hold us back from you was paid for and put away. We thank you that in love, while we were still weak in sin, you called us to be your treasured possession among all the peoples, that though we were once in darkness, you have made us lights set on a hill, beacons of your restoring love, that though we were unclean, unfit for your home, you have called us a holy nation, a people set apart for your glorious purpose. And although we struggle feebly, weighed down by the sin that still clings so close, you have made us priests, mediators of your gospel. And so we pray, Lord, that as we gather this morning to hear from your words and sing your praises, that you would fit us in your grace for such a holy calling. Help us to be the church you redeemed us to be, that the nations might see our good deeds and glorify you on the day of your coming. For we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, let me welcome you to church once again. Many of our own folks are away on holiday this week, but perhaps you're visiting us for the same reason. And if that's you, it's lovely to have you. We have a holiday Sunday school today for children aged three to seven. So if you aren't quite sure where to go for that, just follow everyone out during the next hymn, and I'm sure someone friendly will help you find the right place. Hopefully you've found two pieces of paper on your seat this morning. One is for our prayer partners this month, which for April is UCCF, so do please take that and read it, and be remembering Pete Dixon and his team supporting gospel mission in Scotland's universities, and of course many of our own folk who serve on the UCCF team or support the Christian unions in Glasgow. And secondly, you should have a flyer for our guest event on Friday the 22nd, The Usual Suspects. It's an intriguing name, isn't it? And if you know Alex and Kate and Nima, the suspects in question, who will be sharing their testimony, you'll know that that will be an intriguing night. All the Lord's people are unusual people, aren't they? And yet, he's a God who loves to show grace to the unexpected. So do be thinking about who you could bring along to that. I'm sure it'll be a really helpful way to introduce our friends to how our God works. Uh, We've got no notice sheets today. But life is carrying on as usual this week. There'll be our ladies' Bible study tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Our lunchtime Bible talk this Wednesday at 1.15. But no small groups or prayer meeting uh, this week. So if you've always wondered what tedious television you miss on a Wednesday night, now's your chance to find out. And we meet again tonight at 6.30 with Edward Lobb opening up the Bible for us. And finally, do please remember our Iranian brothers and sisters next weekend as they head to our broth for the Farsi weekend away. I'm sure they'll enjoy being together. So let's pray that the teaching will be just right for them and a real time of gospel growth. Well, in a little while, Paul Brennan will be continuing his series in Paul's letter to Titus that he began in our evening services. So perhaps you turn with me to Titus chapter 3 page 998 in the Church Bibles. And Paul will be focusing today on verses 9 to 11, but we'll read from verse 1 just to remind ourselves where we are. So 
So then Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them, says Paul, that is, Christians in Crete under his care, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. Amen. This is God's word, and may it challenge us this morning. And as we respond to what we've just read, we're going to sing again number 567 in our blue books. A hymn all about what it means to live united around the Lord Jesus. Christ is made the sure foundation, the head and cornerstone of his church. Let's stand and sing.
Well, as the musicians play, uh, the offering will be uplifted. Perhaps as they do so, you might want to just flick back to Titus and have a look over Paul's letter there. But the offering for the Lord's work here and across the globe will be uplifted just now. pray particularly for uh, the work of UCCF as we come to the Lord now. Let's pray. Mm. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we are not alone in the work that you have commanded us to do. We thank you for one another. We thank you too for our gospel partners across the globe and nearer to home. And we pray particularly for the work of UCCF as they seek to support the Christian unions across the country. And we pray particularly for those who are known to us as a church. We pray for Andy and Naomi Baxter as they work here in Glasgow, uh, for Scott Hamilton in Edinburgh, and uh, for Paul McFadden up there in Dundee. Would you please strengthen them in their work, particularly as they work with new CU committees and help the Christian unions to remain focused on the work of proclaiming the gospel uh, to their fellow students. Please enable them to support the students, give them wisdom, give them discernment, give them an ability to encourage and to direct and to support and build up those students. We thank you too for the recent events weeks held across the UK and the universities. We thank you for the encouragement seen as folk heard and responded to the gospel. We pray for the ongoing opportunities as students look to share John's gospel with their friends. Give them a boldness and a courage in that task. Would you give them a great confidence in your word, confidence in its truth, confidence in its 
ability to transform lives by the gospel. And so as we come in a moment to your word, please help us to remember, Father, that you alone are able to order our wayward wills and change the affections of our sinful hearts. Would you help us to love the thing that you command and to desire what you have promised so that in the midst of life's changes and events, our hearts may be surely fixed upon what you have said and promised, where true joys alone are to be found. So please help us this morning as your people draw near to us, teach us, instruct us, encourage us, challenge us. We ask it for your sake and in Jesus' name. Amen. Now as we come to the Lord's word, we sing the hymn on the screens. Lead, holy shepherd, lead us. Thy feeble flock we pray. Thou king of little pilgrims, safe, lead us all the way. Let's sing together. Please do turn back to Titus chapter 3, uh, page 999 in the church Bibles. Titus 3, we're looking at verses 9 to 11. Now, nobody likes a party pooper. You know the sort of person I'm talking about? The one is always turning the volume down on the music, sending people home as soon as the clock strikes 8.35. I was a self-inflicted party pooper last night, happily watching the golf, enjoying the Masters, and it hit 10 o'clock and I thought, I've got to go to bed, it's an early start. So I was a self-inflicted party pooper, but no one likes a party pooper. And that's exactly what Paul appears to be here this morning in these verses. 
His letter's been going so well, especially since the start of chapter 2. It's all positive stuff about how to live the good, godly life. Living the good life in the household setting, chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, about living good, godly lives in the public arena. It's all about ordinary Christians adorning the gospel in their ordinary lives. We also have those two glorious gospel summaries in chapter 2 from verse 11 and then chapter 3 from verse 4. These passages set out the glorious gospel, which is the engine that drives our godliness. Wonderful truths, truths that pastors today are to insist upon. Just look on at verse 8 of chapter 3. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you, Titus, to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. It's all very positive, challenging at times, but positive. It's been a great letter, Paul. But then you get to verse 9. You get this but. It would be quite nice, wouldn't it, to be able to cut these couple of verses out of the Bible. Take that bit out and also the second half of chapter 1. They're all rather unpleasant Nasty verses, just not very tolerant, Paul. Why do you have to be such a party pooper, Paul? It's tempting to think that way, isn't it? Tempting to skip over these bits when preaching, but these verses are crucial. They were crucial for Titus to grasp. They were crucial for the church in Crete to get hold of. They're crucial for us as well. Why? Why are verses 9 to 11 so important? Well, because... Hearing Paul's instructions and following them is going to protect the church from two key threats. Threats that, if left unchecked, would totally undermine the witness of the church and, in the end, pull it apart. Remember what Paul's key message to Titus is in the letter. It's to encourage him to teach the truth that leads to godliness. Titus was to press home to the church that their response to the good news of the gospel was to live good and godly lives, the truth that leads to godliness. They were two key things that he was to insist upon, truth and witness. What was said, how they lived, lips and lives, good news and good living. And the threats that Paul tackles in these verses are threats to those two key things, There's an attack on truth, verse 9, and an attack on witness, verse 10. Look again at verse 9. It's all to do with controversy, discussion, quarrels about the law. It's theological discussion, but it's not really about the truth. In fact, it's a threat to the truth. It's a distraction from the truth. Look again at verse 10. It's all about the sort of person who stirs up division and what to do about such a person. It's a person who's not living the good life. It's a person who's not adorning the gospel. That sort of person represents an attack on the unity and the witness of the church. So we'll look at these couple of verses under two points. First, Paul instructs Titus and pastors today to avoid unprofitable distractions. And second, Paul instructs Titus and passes today to warn people that stir up division. Paul is clear. He's authoritative. And far from being a party pooper, he's saying these things for the health and survival of the church. They're pretty hard-hitting, straight-down-the-line verses. It's not going to be a comfortable 20 minutes coming up, but we must hear it. So verse 9, firstly, avoid unprofitable distraction. Now, verse 9 flows on, straight on, from the positive command in verse 8 to teach the truth and to insist on its implications. That is the sort of ministry that Titus is to focus on, teaching the truth, insisting on implications. That's his focus, and he's not to be distracted from it. And distraction is exactly what these unprofitable theological controversies present. We know... Well, if you've been here on Sunday evenings, you know well what sort of place Crete was. 
It was full of empty talkers, liars, evil beasts. We bumped into the Cretan false teacher in the second half of chapter 1. And it probably comes as no surprise that Paul tells Titus to avoid certain speech-related things. There were plenty of people, perhaps, on the fringe of the church in the society around that enjoyed and dabbled in theological speculation. Titus may have been tempted to wade in to get involved with the discussions, with the arguments. But he's not to do it. He's to avoid it. Don't get distracted, Titus. But what was the nature of these theological discussions that he, were going on that he was to avoid? Well, Paul mentions four things in particular. Firstly, it's foolish controversies. Look at verse 9. Avoid foolish controversies. These are just frivolous theological inquiries. Whatever debate happens to erupt on the Christian blogs, suddenly that's the big issue. It's all you talk about. Anyone who listens to you for a moment will hear your take on the latest blog from whoever it is that's written it. Until next week, when the next foolish controversy erupts on social media. Perhaps it's a well-known pastor who's run into trouble. It's all over the news. It's all you talk about, looking into every little sordid detail. Foolish controversy. Unprofitable. Secondly, he mentions genealogies. This is likely uh, to be a, a Jewish type of interpretation based on Old Testament myths and speculation based on family trees. Man-made myths. Avoid it. Thirdly, it's dissensions. Fourthly, quarrels about the law. These are sort of arguments and discord about the law, the Torah, going into the minutiae of this word and that, people getting tied up with small issues, rather than focusing on the main thing, rather than focusing on the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament pointed to. These distractions, says Paul, are to be distinguished from genuine theological inquiry. Genuine inquiry into the truth is profitable. It's good. But these things that he mentions in verse 9 are, according to Paul, unprofitable and worthless. Look at the end of verse 9. That's how he sees them. We, in our church lives, are to invest in that which is profitable. And what is profitable is gospel truth and the implications that flow from it in terms of how we are to live. That's profitable. But we're to avoid that which is unprofitable, foolish arguments, quarrels. What is it that we, as a church, talk about? What do you talk about? Is it the particular bee in your bonnet, trying to gather people around you, persuade people to join your cause? You know the sort of thing. Yeah, you know, the, the Tron, it's a good church, got good teaching, but you know what really annoys me about it? It's not taking this particular issue seriously enough. When was the last time we had a sermon on creationism, or healing ministries, or premillennial dispensationalism? If you don't know what that is, speak to Rupert, I've got no idea. <laughs> Why are we not promoting this conference? Why don't we have this guy come to speak to us? Why don't we sing this particular song? Why isn't everyone reading this book? People will consciously or otherwise promote, gently push their own theological agenda. Don't be distracted, is Paul's message. It's dumb talk. If you're in a conversation that's going that way, people getting really caught up in a particular issue that's Complete distraction. If you find yourself in that sort of conversation, just gently kick it into the long grass. Explain why it's distracting. Explain why it's not worth getting involved with. It's foolish. It's a controversy. Don't be distracted. And pastors in particular are to focus on what matters and to avoid distraction, to keep the church laser-focused on its core mission. There's so much out there you could get involved with, isn't there? Endless stuff you could get sidetracked by, but the church leader particularly must focus on the key thing. 
What do churches spend their time on? The profitable or the distraction? Think about the church business meeting. Is it spent on that which is worthless, foolish controversy? Or is the focus on gospel progress, on that which is profitable? What is it that occupies the pulpits? Is it theological speculation or is it the truth as revealed in the Bible? Is it worthless or profitable? What does it achieve? Change lives or just more pointless arguments? Have nothing to do with these unprofitable theological speculations. That's Paul's instruction to Titus. And it's instruction to us. Don't be distracted. Such things are just not worth engaging with. Church leaders and churches are to focus on that which is profitable and lasting to the truth that leads to godliness. And so we must learn to distinguish and discern the profitable from the unprofitable and then throw our energies into that which lasts, into that which is profitable. It's not always easy, is it, to discern what is worth getting stuck in with what isn't. So we must pray for discernment. What is a core issue? What needs to be tackled? What can be ignored? So pray for your pastor. Pray that he would avoid distraction, that he would avoid peripheral battles and focus on the clear and sound instruction of the truth. That's our first point. Avoid unprofitable distraction. Keep focused on the main thing. Secondly, look on to verse 10, where Paul instructs Titus to warn people that stir up division. Now, the sort of person that Paul has in mind here is the sort of person who intentionally stirs up division in the church family. Now, division is a serious issue in the church. We've seen it already in the letter. Look back to chapter 1, verse 11. Titus was to silence false teachers. Verse 11, they must be silenced since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Titus was to silence them because they were upsetting whole households. And to upset the household of God, to bring division to that which God has brought together, that is very serious indeed. Stirring up division is a particular hobby for many in the church these days. As it was then, it's not a new thing. It's always been there. People just want to get their own way, to have things operate as they want them to operate. We've all got that in us, haven't we? We always want things our way. But it's usually in the sort of areas in church life that you just wouldn't expect division to crop up in. It's not often the big issues that division arises, but rather in the seemingly unimportant. Let me give you an example. A few months ago, I was at a training course with the the PTC. Uh, We had an Australian minister come to visit, and he was talking about this very issue, about division arising in unexpected places. And he gave an example. I think it was the choir, or some individuals within it, caused an absolute stooshie about a change to the service times. I think it was a half hour change. It was going to move from a 10.30 to a 10 o'clock service. And they were up in arms. They thought it was all about them. People were coming to hear them sing. And this was going to throw people off. It was a threat to them. A small thing like that, just changing the time of a service, gave certain people in that church an opportunity to stir up division, to want things their way, to stamp their feet, to throw their weight around. And that sort of thing is dangerous. That sort of thing causes division. And Paul urges Titus to warn people that stir up division. Warn them with a view to restoring. Perhaps unaware of what they're really doing. Unaware of the impact they're really having. Pastors are to warn them for two reasons. For their own sake and also for the health of the church. But before we look at what Titus is to do, what church leaders now are to do, a word to would-be stirrers up out there. Now, we've all got it in us, haven't we? 
If you're the sort of person who likes to get their own way, particularly in church life, don't do it. To insist on your way when others have made a decision, that will often cause division. And in particular, refusal to repent when warned. Well, that's very serious indeed. Just look at the language Paul uses for unrepentant division makers. Verse 11. Such a person is warped, sinful, self-condemned. It's pretty tough stuff, isn't it? Perhaps, perhaps you need to hear this warning today. Perhaps even this week you've got your sights set on an area of church life where you're going to make your mark. Whatever it may be, the flower arranging or the coffee rotor, whatever it might be, don't do it. It causes division. It threatens the unity of the household of God. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that we can't contribute. We can't make suggestions or bring up a new idea. Of course not. But that is quite a different thing from stirring up division. There is a distinction. Perhaps you want to take issue with a particular decision that's already been made by the church. It could be anything from the trivial, the color of a carpet, or maybe something more substantial, the way a particularly difficult pastoral issue has been handled. Whatever it is, we are to trust our church leaders in the decisions that they make, in the direction they take. They will have at their disposal a lot more information than you probably do. Perhaps you think you could have dealt with it better. The situation could have been handled differently, and possibly yes. Everyone's infallible. Everyone's fallible, sorry. As you've just seen. (laughs) Everyone's fallible. I'm sure they could have done it better. But there should be a presumption of trust in our leaders, in those who make decisions. So we should think very carefully before throwing our weight around, questioning, challenging those who are leading us. Paul takes the creation of division very seriously indeed. So then, what happens when somebody does cause division? What was Titus to do? What are church leaders today to do? Well, they are to warn. Look again, verse 10. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Now, the word warning here has the sense of admonition, and that includes instructing, correcting, warning. It's all done with a view to restoring the offender. Think of a father admonishing his son, seeking to get him back on track. The church leader is to seek to win them back with corrective teaching, instruction, to warn them about the impact their behavior is having. And he is to warn once, And then again, if the first warning has no impact. And if that second warning is not heeded, if there's no repentance, no turning away from what they've done and said, then the church leader is to have nothing more to do with them. They're to be excluded. Excluded both to protect the unity of the church, but also to seek to bring them to repentance when they see how serious it is. Now, perhaps what Paul's suggesting here seems a little harsh. You've got two chances, then you're out. But it's absolutely the right approach. Jesus himself advocates the same thing in Matthew chapter 18. Two public warnings followed by having nothing more to do with someone who's unrepentant persistently. It could be very easy for a church leadership to be consumed with individuals just like this who cause problems, meeting after meeting after meeting, deciding what to do. There is a genuine desire to be wise and gentle and sensitive to seek to win such a person back. But there is a danger that such a person just swallows up energy and time and people. More and more energy from those in leadership is spent on this one person. A huge distraction from the key tasks. So Paul's approach here of two strikes and you're out is good and right. 
because it gives an opportunity to repent, but it also keeps church leaders focused on what they must focus on, focused on the need of the wider flock, focusing on that which is profitable. And if such a person doesn't respond after two warnings, it's unlikely they'll respond after ten. So we need to be praying for our church leaders that they would have courage to tackle such things. It's not easy. I don't know anyone that enjoys doing this sort of thing. Do pray for them and stand by them when they take a stand against those who cause division. So there we have Paul's two key instructions for church leaders. Have nothing to do with foolish talk that leads nowhere. Warn those who cause division. But there's also an implication for all of us here. It's not just for church leaders and what they're to do. You see, there's a link between the two points. A link between foolish, controversial talk and division. One leads to the other. You see, dumb talk is more dangerous than you think. Dumb talk about anything you can think about in church life and doctrine, if left unchecked, will snowball and cause division. Dumb talk about anything. Music, preaching style, about what appears in the notices, about what events we do, about the color of the walls. Dumb talk, foolish talk about anything that is designed to stir up a bit of division. That's dangerous. So the way that you talk, the things that you say, can build up others, or it can cause them to stumble. It doesn't take long for a few foolish words to spread like wildfire. And before long, factions are formed, division becomes inevitable, and there's massive fallouts. Dumb talk is more dangerous than you think. So are you an instigator of such talk? Or do you encourage it? Or are you a buffer? Are you one who dampens down such talk so that it goes no further? Now, it's not to say that we can't talk about things. If you've got questions or ideas. But if you've got a real problem with something that's happening in church, then the thing to do is to go and speak to the church leader. Take it to them. Don't be gossiping about it and causing other people to stumble. Take it to those who are in in leadership. But we can all be buffers. We can all dampen down such things, can't we? Dumb talk is dangerous. So do you see why it's so important that church leaders heed these warnings to heed what Paul is saying? These things that he's warning about threaten the witness of the church. Remember, Paul's big concern for the church then and today is that we would be committed to the truth that leads to godliness. And commitment to the truth means a commitment to teaching the truth and to living out its implications, good works in home, in public. And a church that does that, that teaches the truth and lives out the implications, will adorn the gospel. It will shine bright in the world. People will notice And the things that Paul warns about here threaten that witness, threaten that adorning of the gospel. So will you be one who commits to, who talks about that which is profitable? Will you be one who builds up the church? Or will you be one who, by the words you use, slowly tear it down, cause division? Will you commit to pray for church leaders that they would follow Paul's pattern here that they'd be willing to avoid that which is distracting that they'd be willing to warn those who cause division the witness of the church is at stake it's a sobering message isn't it but it's an important one and we must heed it let's pray
For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Lord, what a precious and beautiful thing your church is. The bride of Christ, bought with his own blood, bought to be zealous for good works, to adorn the gospel. How precious your church is. Help us to heed these warnings, these sober warnings, which threaten that witness and unity of what you've brought together. Would we, would we be ones who build the unity of the church, that through our words we may build up and encourage? Help us to be buffers who dampen down the sort of talk that might cause division. And would you strengthen our leaders that they might be strong to focus on that which is profitable and to keep us focused on that which is lasting so that you might be glorified and that the church might be built. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we close, we sing together hymn number 568. And as we sing this, we remind, we remind ourselves of what Titus is seeking to protect, the witness of the true church to the watching world. Church of God, elect and glorious, holy nation, chosen race, called as God's own special people, royal priests and heirs of grace. Hymn number 568.
do stay and chat to folk, perhaps somebody you've not met before, do stay around and encourage each other as we gather together. But as we finish, let me pray. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.